Hey, good morning. This is Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System. We're back at it this morning. We're back to talk about all things COVID and beyond. Today, I am joined by a couple of very special guests. Jeff Burns is a neurologist here and co-director of the KU Alzheimer's <coughs> Disease Center. You know, one thing we, we haven't really spoken about too much yet is the impact of, of uh, COVID on people who are isolated and who may have some type of cognitive impairment like Alzheimer's or dementia. And Jeff will be addressing that. Also back with us today, and thank you, Greg Nawalnik. Greg is here to talk more about some of the social iso isolation. And we also have Doc Hawk, who is on the road today, and uh, he's in blue bo boxers, as far as I could tell, but I guess we can't see that. Well, let's hope the guy we're not. Uh, but, but the truth is, uh, he is on the road. We're going to talk more about traveling today. So much stuff came up about traveling, so we want to address that. And also, what it doesn't mean for if you need to go travel to see somebody who is an elderly parent or anybody who may have some cognitive impairment. So we really have a pretty big thing uh, going on today. And uh, we also have Jessica Lavelle, who is here with an important interview for us about loneliness and isolation. Jessica? Dr. Seitz, good morning. And Dr. Johnson, thank you so much for joining us again this week. Can you help us better understand the, dis the difference between isolation and loneliness? Okay, so when we think of isolation, we think of being physically distanced from each other, that we don't have that physical contact, versus loneliness being a more subjective internal experience. I can be in a room of a thousand people, yet still feel lonely. So it's a difference in internal sensations and feelings and experiences versus physical lack of resources and access to other people. And can you maybe give us some tips um, for folks uh, to help adolescents keep from diving into that feeling of loneliness? Of course, I think social media is a great opportunity to have kids stay connected, reach out and talk to each other um, with parents monitoring the content and the, the sites that they're going on to, but that's a great avenue. A second option would be to have socially distance um, opportunities to get together. So having their friends hang out, six feet apart, but still having that physical connection. And lastly, I would encourage all families to spend as much time as you can together, having family meals, taking walks, but having really good conversations with your teens to get to know them better, to know their dreams and hopes and wishes, but to maintain that connection so you can be aware of any kind of loneliness that might be creeping into those that are isolated. Dr. Johnson, thank you so much for sharing those tips this morning. And Dr. Stites, we'll send it back to you in the studio. Thank you very much, Jess. All right, Doc Hawk, how is it? Where are you now? Um, I am in Florida right now. Florida. Okay, that's not Kansas City. So I did fly. And you flew to Florida. How was it? How, how crowded was the plane? What precautions did you take? So I did do some um, educational videos while in the airport and in the plane. It was nice that in the airport, 50% of people or more probably had masks on, although a lot of them were under their face some of the times. No. Um, in the airport, certainly in Kansas City, there was a lot of hand uh, gel sanitizer stations. In the airplane, there were um, about 80 to 90 percent of people wearing masks, which is important because we know from one of the contact tracing that uh, a gentleman who flew from China to Toronto um, later tested positive, but he had a mask on. And on the contact tracing, they had not identified any secondary contact. So it is very important for people to understand that even if you're not feeling sick, it is all of our responsibility to wear the mask in case we are pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic. So the plane flight went well. I did wear also eye protection. And these were just regular um, goggles that were given to me by a colleague who actually bought them at a local hardware store. And I know that you said you have gotten yours from Amazon as well. So you know, the eye protection, certainly we can, we don't consider glasses um, in the healthcare setting as eye protection. These types of, of, of eye protection that you can buy that really protect around your, your face is really what is going to be important. So overall, it was a good trip. I really tried not to touch anything, and I absolutely did not touch my face um, once getting into the airport, and especially on the plane. Did have alcohol sanitizer with me as well, though. Okay, I, I trust that's the only alcohol you had with you there. Absolutely. Right, well, I have, a, I, I have a spray bottle right here. Glasses, mine right from, right from Amazon, right around the eyes, keep you protected. Actually, 
Eye protection is really important. I don't know that we talk about it enough, but you're really going to go into a high contact situation. We do recommend eye protection. And that's what we wear in our clinics, right? We wear goggles or eye protection of some sort because that is one way you can get the coronavirus. So, all right. So you felt pretty safe flying on that plane, did you? You know, it, it's still a concern, but with all the things that we have talked about and all the things that we're doing, I certainly felt my risk was much lower. Uh, most all of the seats were were separated. The middle the middle aisle was not really used. The middle seat, so that helped as well. Um, and the plane was probably fifty to sixty percent full, so that was definitely helpful. But you said eighty to ninety percent of patients on the plane had their mask on. I thought everybody on a plane flight right now had to wear a mask. You know, I did too. When you look at the um, the the signage, I think it just says encouraged or supposed to. But when I actually looked around, there were definitely two or three people that I could see that didn't have a mask on. Well, thank you very much. And you got, I know you're with us today, so stay safe. you have any idea what the numbers look like today? I do. So unfortunately, our numbers have gone up. We have 14 in the hospital today. And yesterday we talked about there was such a concern because I think we had 10 or 11 and six of those were in the ICU. So a majority of our patients. Today, we know that seven are of the 14 are in the ICU um, and I think three, three ventilators. So Unfortunately, now we're seeing uh, a higher uh, percentage of critically ill patients needing ICU care. You know, and I know some of that's just, it goes up and down a lot to, uh, over time, but, but I also saw a report today about a number of states reporting a spike in hospitalizations related to coronavirus, um, which would have traced back to the Memorial Day weekend. So thoughts about that? Yeah, this is what we've talked about. Um, initially, we said one to two weeks out, but now, you know, certainly, as we look further and we understand about the hospitalization, the process, the inflammatory process after the infection, we are starting to think more three to four weeks out from the original um, infectious event is when we would start seeing the hospitalizations. Okay. Well, let's hope it doesn't keep going in. It's a mild wave so far, and we've been, we're still far below our peak of 40 patients. And so yeah. I think uh, I, 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 I feel comfortable saying that I don't think we're getting back to that level, but I... We've long held that once society reopened and people really came in closer contact, we'd see more. However, the jump from 10 to 14, it's hard to know what that means until you get a whole lot more days in a row to see what happens. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, Jeff, you've spent a life dedicated to trying to help those who have Alzheimer's and, and other problems that really lead to you know, a loss of how smart we are, our cognitive function, ability to process. My family would conclude many years ago that I was there. But um, you, you've really done that for a long time. Talk to us a little bit about the effects that you're seeing in your patients of COVID-19 and the whole coronavirus. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's especially important in our patients because it's a vulnerable population. You know, they're older adults and uh, they're uh, dealing with things like cognitive impairment. And so, uh, and many of them are in long-term care facilities. So where, where uh, you know, a lot of people, vulnerable population together, and we know that if the virus gets into that, that environment, it spreads quickly and, uh, and has, you know, a high, uh, high lethality in that population. So, um, so, you know, and actually what, you know, the data I've seen is about a third of the deaths in the United States are in nursing home populations. So, um, so we have to take it very seriously. Um, and for the most part, the patients that I've seen uh, are taking it seriously, and they're doing a great job of, of you know, isolating and, um, and, you know, wearing masks in public and, uh, and you know, taking it seriously. So, um, so that's good. Uh, um, you know, the, the, probably the biggest impact is in our delivery of care where we've moved to, um, to more um, telehealth. And, you know, the good news is that that move to telehealth has really been helpful. We're finding, um, you know, it, it was new to us as physicians, but we're finding that we can actually do probably 95% of what we need to do um, and, and really continue to care for the patients and diagnose and evaluate as well as before for 95% of our patients. So, um, so it's had an impact in our care. It's had an impact on our research, but we're pushing through. And actually, I think we'll come out ahead, um, you know, when we get through this period. So... Yeah, that's a really important point. And, and how have you been able to still do research trials during the age of COVID? Because I've heard some places shutting down clinical trials and not wanting to worry about the loss of PPE for a research sub subject, but it's still so important to study. 
the effects of this crisis on patients with Alzheimer's? Yeah, so I mean, we've had to make big, uh, uh, big changes, uh, but despite those changes, we've continued to really move forward our research. So, um, you know, we we in the early days, we did have to kind of shut things down um, and figure out how do we move forward. Uh, but we've, you know, the the momentum's continued, and we're we're you know, Alzheimer's is continuing, and our research is continuing, and now we're back, and we're really. Um, really moving back to full sort of productivity. Everything's different. You know, we have a whole new normal. Um, you know, people are working at home primarily. Um, we probably have 20% of our staff in-house now any given day. Um, so people are working from home. Uh, but we're back. We're seeing our research participants, and we're, we've been able to maintain through these months with these big changes, we've been able to maintain the integrity of our studies um, and, and then we've actually been able to improve some, some, of the, uh, some of the assessments and use telehealth and leverage telehealth. So, um, so you know, we're, 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 still, we're still going and we're going strong, uh, but with a lot, of, a lot of changes. So are you personally getting out in public yet? Getting out, oh, uh, uh, personally? Yes. Um, not a lot. Well, I mean, uh, look at your haircut and think it. maybe there's one place you should go. Just a thought. I don't know. You know, uh, that, that, this is a self-cut. Uh -huh. With a little help from my daughter, uh, but yeah. Did she do your right sideburn right there? Is that was her? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. the, 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 where the hair's yeah. sticking out? <laughs> I need to touch that up, but that's the hard part. Yeah, uh, there the you edges. go. Those are hard ones to do for yourself. There yeah. you go. Well, Greg, it has been a, this isolation is just tough, and 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 you know we 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 talked about it before, and Dr. Johnson just mentioned it as well. But but talk to us a little bit. What does it mean, especially for an elderly population? Those who can be shut in to begin with may have some loneliness and depression to start with, and anybody who has cognitive impairment. Well, I think you, you nailed it on the head there. The, this population is very vulnerable uh, to, to these situations because as their health deteriorates, families are less able to really provide all the support that they need, and so nursing homes become kind of the, the last option. And I think what COVID has magnified, so even before COVID, as uh, family members were, were placed in nursing facilities, um, family members are less able, or maybe even sometimes less likely to come and visit because it's kind of a depressing place to be. And so we don't really love to go towards depression. I mean, we love our loved ones, but the problem is that, so for people that didn't have good family support before, they got that experience of the loneliness and the depression in the skilled nursing facility, not having the ability to get out and do what they wanted to do. You look at the family members who did have an engaged family, now they've been de facto isolated. They're not allowed to have the visit. So everybody now has a non-supportive family in terms of actual yeah. physical interaction and connection. So now we've seen the people that even would have had preservative factors are still at risk more so because uh, they're really feeling the impact and they understand uh, the rationale behind it. But as we're talking about cognitive issues, some folks at certain days, certain times, aren't able to, to, to quickly draw and say, okay, I'm doing this because of COVID. I'm doing this because of, you know, trying to, trying to protect our health and that it can spread. They just know that, you know, family isn't showing up the way they used to. Why is this happening? And then it can cause a bit of panic, heightened anxiety, depression, all these things. And then when we talk about loneliness, uh, you know, it, research has shown that it, it impacts the body in much the same ways as smoking, obesity, um, you know, a lot of the big gun health issues that we look to and say, oh, well, if you've got those, you're, you're not gonna do very well. Um, we don't think about loneliness as having that kind of power, but yet it can disrupt your sleep. It can absolutely, um, you know, cause inflammation in the body, which inflammation feels like pain, pain when you're miserable gets magnified. And so it's a self-feeding process and then depression and anxiety get the volume turned up a bit and depression loves to feed on isolation so once you've started down the isolation road it becomes less and less likely without significant intervention and active an active choice to engage again uh, that you'll just continue down this malaise path of uh, you know lack of activity and so guys what do we do i mean what do we do what do you guys both recommend what can we do that's most important for folks who are older and kind of shut in and you're worried about all this whole cycle, what do we do? I, 
I think we take advantage of the technological advances that are available to us. Um, I, I know that uh, one of the studies I was reading talks about the, the benefit of book clubs. Seems like book clubs are really going to be the thing to get us through this. Yeah, um, book clubs. I, I, mainly, we're just watching movies right now. Yeah, we, I, I was going to say, I, I was actually even, ready to adapt. We gave that. up reading. But. I, I was going to say, I was going to adapt that and say you could also do a movie club. There's like the AFI, you know, top hundred whatever movies. Oh uh, no, we're into like only the nice <laughs> stuff. You know, we're watching Emma and, and uh, Pride and Prejudice, Sound of Music. That was a big hit. Yeah, you know, we're, it's only you know wholesome shows. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> no more stress. Fair enough. So you know, any but anything that we can uh, share the experience where you're doing something on your own. So reading the book, watching the movie, whatever it is, and then having set times to get together on a Zoom platform or any sort of uh, you know social media platform. For discussion and there are some options out there that you are moderated discussions others is you're kind of on your own um, and I will say I was thinking about it last night in, in kind of preparation for this when the outbreak first hit I had a couple of zoom hangouts with some of my buddies from California that you know I haven't seen in, in far too long and it was great it's like we were right back together again we're, we're laughing hysterically and having a good time we did that once <laughs> <laughs> so I, as I'm the guy telling you this is what you should be doing, I'm not doing it. And so that tells wow. you just how much it it's takes hard. the actual effort. Uh, and, and the road to hell is paved with good intentions. You know, we need to actually put the action and effort in so that we're not just saying, hey, let's do this. And everybody's like, yeah, you've got to actually set up the meeting, make yeah, it happen. We so do. that's the. And we also have this thing about our book club. You know, I, I end up, the other movie I like to watch is called The Super Bowl, and I keep watching Super Bowl 54 <laughs> again and again, and I think it's 1,827 times thus far, and I'm sure it'll be 28 by tonight. And the good news is we keep winning. That's so great. It's awesome. <laughs> but I'm still a little stressed every time. Okay, what do you do? Um, you tell your folks, patient, what have well, you been we, doing to try and break so, through the isolation? Yeah, I mean, I mean, technology, take advantage of technology for sure. Um, it's very important uh, way to reach reach you know the uh, the loved one, uh, but you know the, the other thing that we think a lot about is the caregiver, so the person who's living with somebody with dementia, uh, their health, um, and we preach routines. Routines are really important, and then it's the basics, right? Sleep well, wake up at the same time, go to bed at the same time, uh, eat well, um, exercise, get outside and exercise. Um, and then keep your brain active. So read, socialize, use technology to, to reach your friends, uh, write letters. People still do that a little bit. Um, and uh, so write letters, uh, have the grandkids draw pictures. And, um, but you can find ways to connect it. Yeah, it's different. Um, and there is, you know, there's a lot stacked, a lot more stacked against caregivers. There's a lot stacked against them in the first place. Uh, and now we have, we have, uh, we have more, but uh, so it's different, but we can adapt, and, um, and there are ways to reach people. But, you know, it, it is taking a toll on some folks, um, but, but, you know, we can, we can overcome some of this for sure with technology and then sort of the basics. So as a physician who went to medical school and as a neurologist, did you just recommend letter writing? Because my handwriting is not decipherable. <laughs> no. But did you just recommend that? You can type, too. Okay, that's yeah. better. I can do that one. <laughs> I type. Okay, that's yeah. what I do, too. All right. Media folks are out there. Anybody have any questions for us this morning? Not hearing any. Jill, let's pivot and let's talk to our audience today. Oh, we, we have kind of a grouping. Nancy has questions for Dr. Hawkinson All with right, his Hawk. travel. Here we go. She wants to time. know, did you eat or drink on the flight? All right, Hawk, did you get some, something to eat or drink? And I know you didn't have any alcohol, right? That is absolutely correct. So as Dr. Nawalvac said, um, he is saying, preaching to do these things, but he's not doing them. Um, I actually have been doing them, and even to a heightened extent. I did not eat or drink anything on the plane. I certainly um, had a little bit before I went into the, uh, the airport, but on the planes and in the airport, um, I, didn't, I didn't drink anything. I um, certainly didn't have any alcohol, uh, but again, continued the frequent hand hygiene. I absolutely did not touch my face, and once my um, eye protection was on, didn't touch that or manipulate that either. So really tried to be um, heightened as far as that, uh, that stuff is going, to really try and protect myself all that much more because you don't know who you will be in contact with. You can liken it to going to the grocery store in Kansas City or going to get gas. But you also have to know you're, you're meeting people and coming into contact with people or other areas that people from around the country are in. So 
I've continued to do that and, and did not um, eat or drink anything once I got into the airport. You know, and, and, I, and I'm impressed that the alcohol you use is only on your hands. That's good work. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm going to try. Kansas City. I love it. I'm going to be traveling. I, uh, I'm heading down to the Ozarks again. You, know, you guys probably have figured out by now. It's a place I'd love to go down to the Mark Twain National Forest, getting into a very remote cabin. Um, and But I'm driving. I'm not flying. I can control my bubble, I think, a little better that way uh, and, and use a lot of hand sanitizer, use my mask whenever I'm out of the car and, and getting gas and wipe down the gas pump, got my alcohol wipes ready to go. And I think you can make it a really safe experience, but you have to be smart about how you travel. And it's all about that. Joanne wants to know, did you use any specific type of mask? And going through security, do they let you keep your mask on? Okay, Hawk. Man, this is going to, you're, you're now the travel expert. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so the mask, the mask was from, um, from the hospital. Um, it's, it's similar to masks that now I think you can find more in the, um, in, in the grocery stores or in the pharmacies. In fact, I saw a lot of people with those types of masks on. Um, certainly probably about the same proportions as we saw with people just with cloth masks on. Um, but they did allow, as you go through security, to keep the mask on. Certainly when I went through TSA, just showing my boarding pass and ID, I just had to remove the ear loops so they could see my face. But other than that, through the security itself, um, the mask was, was on as well. All right. A couple more for him, and then we have some questions coming in for the other panelists. Um, are you going to have your room cleaned, and did you use the bathroom? I hope you public, used the bathroom. Public, public restrooms bathroom. at the airport Let's start with the public on the bathroom. plane. What about the public Sorry. bathroom, Doc Hawk? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. I used, uh, I used the bathroom, the restroom uh, in the airport. Um, again, I went in there a couple times, even if I didn't have to use it, just to wash my hands. So I did wash my hands three, four, five times um, while in the airport, not in a, an OCD sense, but I was just very cognizant of trying to maintain good hand hygiene. Um, I didn't really have a problem otherwise using the restroom. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I felt pretty safe. Um, again, the main factor I was really trying to control is not touching my face, um, especially once getting into the airport. And as you start to do that and you make that a conscious effort, after a day or two or even maybe 12 hours, that starts to become just a, um, a secondary thing that you don't even think about, an unconscious thing. And if you can do that, you're really going to avoid a, a lot of these dangers that we're talking about. You know, you better not get COVID because if you do, if you do become positive for SARS-CoV-2, you will be the biggest setback for the airline industry in a long time. So we gotta keep it healthy out there. You know, that uh, that played into my mind as well. And again, that's why it, it, I was trying to be more heightened. Uh, but still, going back to the training and going back to those simple points that we have been talking about since day one, and I think doing that um, in addition to wearing the mask, wearing the eye protection. And again, if you don't have eye protection, if you can't make it out to the hardware stores we've talked about, we've even had Dr. Cannon on when he was, when he was first on, he, he talked about going to the hardware store and purchasing some eye protection for him and his colleagues um, in the emergency department. If you can't do that, certainly, you know, glasses or, or large sunglasses type, that may offer a little bit of protection as well. But again, wear the mask, do the hand hygiene, don't touch your face and you're really gonna reduce that risk as much as you can. I know one thing that many have kind of looked at masks and made a decision not to wear them. I would just urge you to remember that there's this pretty important asymptomatic period where you can spread the virus. Now the World Health Organization had, I'm not quite sure, I think they had a cognitive moment there, Jeff, when they said, we're not sure if you can spread it during uh, asymptomatic transmission. I don't know what, I don't know what they were thinking at that point, but by the next day they had corrected that statement because it is absolute, I mean, this is not really a question, right? It's absolutely clear you can spread coronavirus during an asymptomatic phase just as you can with influenza, just as you can with other viruses. Before you get symptomatic, you can start spreading them. So it's not a surprise you can do it with coronavirus. It may be longer with SARS-CoV-2. And so I, masks clearly make a difference because you can spread the disease before you actually have symptoms. And some people don't ever even have symptoms. Beyond that, our, yeah, I think we have a social duty to keep each other safe. And the assumption that you're not sick and that you're not gonna spread it to someone is a dangerous assumption, Dana. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with you. And I want to echo that with now as we look at our, our brave men and women, um, I think it was on the Theodore Roosevelt, the U.S. Navy ship, when they looked at that group of patients, that cohort, they found that um, in reducing your risk of getting COVID on that ship was people who wore masks and people who had hand hygiene and also tried to stay away from larger group gatherings. So even on that confined space, we understand what we can do to reduce risk of, of getting this infection. It makes a really big difference. And I think that's the message we all need to remember. And even if you live in areas where there aren't a lot of folks, if you get around other folks, well, you still have the, the you're, you're going to entail the same risk as anybody in an urban area. So really important. Just one more. They just keep coming in and then we're going to switch. But did you handle your luggage or did you do carry on? How'd you do the luggage thing? And did you wipe down your luggage? You know, I did not wipe down my luggage. I did check my bag. I also had a carry-on backpack. I'm not really concerned about the virus if it's on my hands. Um, if it's on the surface of my hands and palms, why am I not so worried about that? Because number one, I'm not touching my face. Number two, I am doing frequent hand hygiene. If I do have to manipulate my mask or my eye protection, I'm gonna make sure that I'm gonna do either hand washing or hand gel before that. So um, knowing that, I did not have a problem checking my luggage or, or take carry on or anything like that. And I really tried to avoid height as much as possible um, while in the airport and also um, while on the plane. Yeah, I think it just makes such a difference to do this. The pillars of infection control, and we keep coming back to them, right? Wash your hands or gel them. Don't touch your face. Cough into your elbow. Wear a mask. Keep your distance. Those are the things we've been preaching for now months let's just say it and uh i i think we in fact we know that when people do it we keep folks safe and what we're now seeing is exactly what we feared that as public opens back up we're seeing a spike in a number of states and there are rises even occurring in kansas and missouri so don't let's let's just be smart because we know if we do the right thing we can contain it it's when we start deciding to take liberties or maybe it's not quite as bad as we thought it was or maybe it's not really real. We start fooling ourselves into complacency, into being overly confident that we're not gonna get sick. That's what's gonna make us sick. The virus doesn't have to make you sick. What can make you sick is your own action. Donna wants to know if your daughter drove or flew when she came to visit. And my daughter flew when she came to, came to visit, and we actually had rehearsed how she was going to do it uh, to make sure she was doing it. She's pretty smart. She didn't really need a lot of rehearsal, actually. She's smarter than I am. But she uh, she knows that you had to, to, to wash your hands, not touch your face, keep your distance, and all those things and until she got here. And we could do her symptom check and her temperature check, and I could try to screen her. Uh, we did not do a COVID test on arrival. We did the symptom check, and I also knew her pattern of behavior was such that she was really good at sheltering in place back in Chicago, Dana. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd like, like to add one awesome. more thing since getting to the destination. I'm gonna continue the practices that I'm doing in Kansas City. I haven't been to a restaurant yet. Um, any meal has been takeout and I'm absolutely gonna avoid uh, bars, restaurants, or other confined spaces. And really it's gonna be continued physical distancing with use of, use of mask. For instance, if I do go to a store, um, and then again, frequent hand hygiene. So those practices have not changed, even though I'm not physically in Kansas City. Uh, you know, mentally I am as far as that goes, and I'm remembering uh, the proper things to do, again, to mitigate my risk from getting COVID as much as possible. And the so cleaning the room. Was and he cleaning gonna... the room. He's wiping the room. He's doing all those things. So he's not going to have yeah. the maid come in? Oh, are you going to have a maid come into your room, Dana? Yeah, we'll do the cleaning, uh, but I also did bring um, Clorox wipes from home as well that I had in my checked bag. So I'm trying to continue to do those things, um, again, just as I would do um, in Kansas City. I don't have a problem with the maid coming and cleaning. Again, most of the household cleaning products are very active against coronavirus, um, so I'm not really concerned about that. Known, and what we now know as this crisis has gone on is that surfaces are important, not maybe as important as we thought they were initially, it's all about the spit. I mean, the more the more you get out there, the more the problem is, and, and hence the masks have taken on a lot of importance in any sort of social setting and in travel. Okay, we, I think we have some questions coming up now for for both Jeff and Greg. Let's, let's focus on some of those. So Joanne writes, my mom has Alzheimer's, and we discuss why we are not visiting. 
but she can't remember. Is it okay to keep telling her what is going on over and over again? So Jeff, let's talk about that. And then I want to pivot over to Greg. I want to follow up with you about, gosh, how hard is that for families? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, that's a problem. Um, you know, and I think it's okay to continue to explain why they're not showing up. Um, you know, it, 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 there's some things where it doesn't, you know, bear repeating, but that would be one, why, you know, why are they not visiting or why are they visiting only by, you know, FaceTime or whatever. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a particular problem. So I would just tell them and keep, you know, send them pictures and send them letters and try to visit, use the technology to visit as much as possible. I think that that sounds like great advice. And, and Greg, from your standpoint, the impact of family members trying to support someone with Alzheimer's. Uh, I mean, for Alzheimer's specifically, there are a number of, of, of very unique challenges uh, that can be incredibly taxing on family members. And so earlier we referenced, you know, caregiver support. And I think that it's important that anybody who is providing care or family members of individuals with, with Alzheimer's, individual therapy is a great resource and a great tool to have because there are a lot of uncomfortable feelings that are difficult and you just need to be able to have a, a safe place to express these. Um, maybe even pick up some, some tips on how to adjust and adapt uh, to, to that situation. Uh, but as far as anybody with family members, um, you know, who are at risk, whether it be with Alzheimer's or just in skilled nursing facilities, this has been incredibly hard because we tend to equate skilled nursing placement with end of life. And so you know that time is kind of of the essence. This is when we need to be forming those connections, saying those things we need to say, enjoying the moment. Um, and so I think that it's something that everybody can learn from at this point, which is how valuable the time and the interaction that we have with one another is and really trying to maximize that. And so this has been very disruptive for people who can't go and have that intimate, have the hug with, with Nana or whoever. Um, you know, you, you want to at least still be as engaged as possible, communicate the caring. Um, you know, the letters are great, uh, kids coloring pictures, any little thing. And one of the things that's really helpful and beneficial for, uh, you know, Asian population is something that, that anybody can do. It's technically a skill called narrative therapy, but um, where you ask them questions about times that they remember back in their, you know, when, when they weren't in a skilled nursing facility. Fun, fun memories of family trips, um, you know, little trouble they got into when they were kids, just different stories that take them back. Because when we tell stories from our, from our past, we, it, a piece of us relives that experience. And so it takes you out of this prison that your body may have become and let you be a more full version of yourself, even just for that little bit of time. It's very beneficial. Yeah, I think that's beautifully said. I love to story tell right now. I, mean, I can't <laughs> tell you that. Hey, do you remember what Dad, you've told it 1,227 <laughs> times. Let's just watch the Super Bowl again. Right. <laughs> I have people that want to go visit their 80 and 90 some year old parents. Andrea says that her brother from Phoenix is going to join. And they just, they're having kind of maybe a little house divided on how to do it. All right. Shall, a, should we do it? B, can we do it? Let's start off. First of all, what do you guys think about that, Jeff, about going to see this 89-year-old? And can you come from different cities and all gather together to see folks? You know, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd actually We're going to hit it. Don't guys. worry. We're going to get that infectious I, disease part. Okay. So, I mean, I think the answer starts with the infectious disease part. But, I mean, if you can visit on their porch or, in, you know, in their yard, which I've, we've done many times with my parents with, and my kids, um, is hang out in the backyard um, and distance. And, uh, you know, and so I think if there's a way to do it and, and do it by the rules that come from these guys, uh, then do it. It's important. Um, but, you know, follow the rules. Yeah, it is. It is really about those rules. And so it's funny when my daughter came in from Chicago now, she's not 80 years old, but uh, I, I, you know, greeted her. And, and the next day, Bob Page, our CEO, he asked me, he said, so, so did you give her a hug? I said, yeah, I gave her a hug. I mean, she's my kid. What are you going to do? You got to give a hug. And I think that's just part of the calculated risk, Dana. We all live with calculated risk in the age of COVID. The question is, what are, risk are you willing to assume? It doesn't make one thing right and another thing wrong. And I know folks on our program probably would love to hear, uh, you know, yes, no answers, but there's really not a yes, no answer to this question. The answer is 
what's your level of tolerance for risk and potentially doing yourself harm or a loved one harm. And that's something you all have to have as a conversation. What I would not presuppose is knowing the answer for an 80 or 90 year old grandparent. That's something they should be involved with you in the conversation as long as they can participate. I mean, that's kind of like informed consent. We all want to come together. We know there's increased risk. We don't know how much increased risk is, but it allows us to see each other. And then we can think about what are the th activities we want to do to make it safer. Be on the porch. Everybody wear a mask. Trying to keep six feet away. All those other things. And you know what? I can story tell away. I can story tell just as well six feet away. People can still hear me. And so I think really it just comes down to how much risk are you willing to entertain in a situation like that, Dana? What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I agree with Dr. Burns. I agree with you. You know, if you can do things, understand the risk, talk about it with, with all of the parties involved, know what your bubble is. If you can do things outdoors, that's best. You know, my 97-year-old grandmother is in a nursing facility up in Illinois. She hasn't been able to see my parents. Hopefully, they will lessen some of the restrictions and allow at least people to see each other outside. If you want to give a hug, a hug is a fairly short amount of time that you're really in close proximity with the person, if it's a loved one, go ahead and do that. But understand all of those factors and continue to, to talk about that with all the parties involved. And I, th I think you can do it in a safe manner. Certainly, we would always suggest outdoors and non-confined spaces to start and then go from there. Yeah, and Greg, I think hugs are important. Well, sure. But I think that there was a, a little snippet of that question that was really important as a whole situation I think that everybody is dealing with right now, which is house divided. Um, I don't think that we can say enough about how many homes right now are starting to be pulled in different directions because, you know, the information that came out recently about, uh, you know, the, the kids don't seem to really be spreading it. Yep. Well, so you've got a lot of folks, you know, the, the dad coaches that want to get their kid out, you know, for sports that are starting to ramp back up. And then you've got cautious moms who are saying, I don't know, you know, this doesn't seem right. And then there, the questions that are out there are like, well, was this information gathered during quarantine? Because if everybody was locked down, yeah, no, the kids probably weren't spreading it, you know, because if you have to right. be around someone to spread it. So even the information that comes out is full of, you know, ambiguity and, and question marks. And so family members want to throw information back and forth at each other, and it gets really vitriolic and kind of nasty. And so the one thing I want to kind of encourage from the behavioral health standpoint is try to work together. Don't look at each other as being an enemy and look that the people that have the concern are doing it out of love. They want to make sure that everybody's safe and taken care of to the best of their ability. And I think you say it very well when you say you just have to be on the same page about what your calculated risk comfort level is. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and the biggest problem is from day one is that I think if you have 10 people in a room, who all get COVID, you might have 10 different outcomes. It's, it's that. It is. And, that, and that's that the hard so part. Yeah. And I think the key here is that when you travel or when you're around other groups, you don't know what their risk is necessarily. That's why you have to wear the mask, wash your hands, keep all those things. When you're in a group where you've all decided what your level of risk is, you still do the same things, but you can act a little differently because you've had a discussion about what is how you want to conduct yourself and how you're going to do it. And you've decided and agreed upon the rules of engagement. That's a hard conversation to have. But I don't know of a, hard, of a, of a meaningful conversation in families that sometimes isn't a little hard. I mean, that, sure. that's no different. And our ability to communicate in the midst of a crisis, I'm not sure that's better than our ability to communicate before a crisis. We have to work on those skills, Craig. Yeah, no, it, our, our ability to respond in crisis is actually far worse. Yeah, it is. That's what, you know, I, told my, I told the CFT yeah, yesterday, like, we were having this big conversation. I'm like, look, guys, pandemics suck. I'm just going to be honest. They are just terrible things. They're a beast, and you have to wrestle it to the ground. And it will always emphasize your weakness. Your weakest link will become weaker, and that's where you're going to struggle. Your strengths, they're going to get a little magnified, but man, those weaknesses, they're going to be hard on you. Yeah, and, and the other piece is we've got this uh, fabulous evolutionary hardware on board that when we get into a crisis, whether we're either anxious or angry, our brains switch to you know black and white thinking, yes or no, friend or enemy. You know, So yeah, we're not able too. to really dive into the subtle nuances of debate. We're, we're just all about, you know, are, you're and either you're with me or real against emotionally me. And you're just there, oh, yeah. you're done. Yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah. and so we're, it's, all, it's all friend or foe, and, and if you're a foe, we're, I'm going at you. you know, and, it, and it's bad, bad because we, 
we miss you know who that person is they just become this uh, threat in that moment and that's not what we want to be to each other so I think you're right if you're having these discussions have them in a place of calm know that you're going into it for the right reasons to have this discussion that you're trying to take care of one another it's not about advancing an agenda yeah. it's not looking yeah, at that way it can be hard Bridget needs some a little bit of reconciling between Dr. Burns and Dr. Nawalnik. I think she's okay with talking, you know, to someone about times, good times, and what do you remember? But she says the word remember causes agitation or anxiety with my loved one who has Alzheimer's. Okay, yeah. Jeff. So that's that's got to be a hard yeah. one, right? So how do you talk about that with, uh, with, uh, with other family members? Well, I mean, you know, if there's something that's driving agitation, avoid it. That's where you know you don't need to repeat things and um, you know and remind them of negative things. Uh, uh, so I think you know if you're if you're seeing that you want to avoid it. And you know there's certain words too that are trigger words for people with memory problems. So memory problems is one of them. Um, and so you know I, I you know so try other words memory issues or. Um, um, you know, so work around, work around those words if you're noticing their trigger words. Um, so I, I, th I, I think that's what she's getting. I think at. it is, and, and I would say, you know, one of the experiences you have is, and, and, and people have to let go of this, is trying to debate somebody who doesn't remember. Because mm -hmm. you're, no matter how hard you talk about it and how much you want to do it, you're not going to help the other person. You're just going right. to make them mad. Yeah. You, you, and, and trying to think, oh, I can be rational. No, no, you can't. That's, that's not the way to do it. That's one of the one of the rules is you know don't reason and don't argue and just kind of let it go uh, when you can because you're not going to win that battle. And she's probably already learned she's not going to win that yeah, battle. Yeah, you got to so. make it worse. And so, Greg, yeah, that's got to be really hard for folks. But the reality is, if we do that, we'll end up with a better relationship. And I love that thing about getting into the narrative of what they do remember. Right. And, and the, the piece of that too is that I, I had drifted kind of there and wasn't really specific about, I was speaking about individuals in skilled nursing facilities. Not everyone in skilled nursing facilities has Alzheimer's disease. So, um, you know, and also there are different types of intelligence and memory and, and crystallized memory, the, the old, you know, remote memory, typically is more resistant to decline than recent memory. So they may not remember at all that you came last week, what they had for lunch yesterday, but they still generally remember the, the, the Corvette they used to have when they were younger, you know, these types of experiences. So, yeah. but obviously with Alzheimer's, then there's also wider uh, depersonalization, different issues that come up where they're in that moment very confused and and it's not just your standard you know dementia so yeah so yeah i mean that's a good point is long-term memory is relatively preserved in people with alzheimer's disease so memories of childhood are usually preserved um but what happened yesterday or last week is probably forgotten and so if you're going to reminisce don't reminisce about last week reminisce about you know 30 40 50 years ago yeah, makes important stuff. So I think we have to have time for one more question, then we'll wrap up. Craig wants to know, can someone that is a high risk, such as a diabetic or someone with heart problems, be asymptomatic, or is it mainly healthy people? So Dana, let's talk about that. The risk of asymptomatic uh, um, disease is, is much lower if you already have heart disease, but you can still have an asymptomatic episode. Yeah, I would agree with you. It's certainly much lower. We understand from um, one of the recent publications that, in general, the people that they have found have been uh, fully asymptomatic after it's all said and done, have, again, tended to be uh, female, have tended to be the, the median age was 37 years old, so younger, as opposed to somebody um, who has symptoms. So as you're getting to be uh, older population, and certainly with those types of health issues and chronic health issues, more than likely you're probably gonna have some sort of symptoms and you will not be in that final category of asymptomatic. Yeah, it's, 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 a, uh, it's, a, it's a challenge. And of course, the best thing to do is just keep ourselves safe. So gentlemen, final thoughts from this morning, Greg? Uh, first thought, it was, it was a lot of fun getting run over by the bus driven by Doc Hawk. Thanks for that one. <laughs> um, no, I, I think really we, we want to be making sure that we're doing all that we can to remain as engaged with our social networks that we have. Uh, I think as things are starting to open, um, we just have to be cautious. Um, you know, it's like if you looked at a swim pool that you know had a shark in it, they say they got it out, or maybe not a pool, but a lagoon, there's a shark attack. 
do you want to just rush right back in the water or do you want to maybe wait a little bit let somebody else go in before you see how they do before you decide to go back into the pool or to the beach so that's you know we just so we're wanted... talking shark attack on the show now this is <laughs> 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 so I'm going, I'm going straight well, shark, sharknado here yeah, yeah. yeah. Sharknado. <laughs> i've seen that movie it's terrible <laughs> it's, it's so bad it's funny yeah. sure i'd just say stay focused on the basics you know so eat healthy sleep well exercise outdoors and uh and keep your brain active and you know keep keep learning so those those basics uh will help you get through this all right well thank you guys very much for being here today tomorrow doc hawk is going to talk a little bit about being on the road and pediatrician steve lauer will be here as well with advice for your youngest travelers the show will actually be moderated by jessica lavelle who as i will be traveling as well deep in the ozarks we'll see if i have a cell signal to reach in i don't know i'm not sure there is one where i'm going to be going in the meantime remember that's been our word this morning remember you want to have the opportunity to continue to create new memories. Memories are the best, and the stories we tell, that's what families come together and friends come together and tell those stories, laugh together. It's the best. The way you create those memories is to stay safe. And staying safe will become a memory, hopefully soon enough, but it does make a difference. You can make the difference for yourself and for your loved ones and for everyone you're around. Stay safe out there and remember, until we meet again, there's still no place like home.